You're listening to the OCD Stories podcast, hosted by me, Stuart Ralph. The OCD Stories is a podcast dedicated to raising awareness and understanding around obsessive compulsive symptoms. I do this through interviewing inspired therapists, psychologists, and people who have experienced OCD. Welcome to the OCD Stories. Hey guys, and welcome to episode 414 of the OCD Stories podcast. And in this one, I chat with Duke. Duke has kindly agreed to share his OCD story with us. Now, Duke is a spoken word poet, and I've been aware of him for some time, and I got to meet him uh, in October, where I got to see him share his story a couple of times. It was great to get him on, give him more space to expand on that story, and it was, it was great to hear the detail. So in particular, we talk about his compulsions, drinking to cope, POCD, real event-themed OCD, a suicide attempt, getting treatment, therapy groups, how OCD targets numbers for him. Duke shares two spoken word pieces. We discuss type 1 diabetes and how OCD latches onto his diabetes, the things that have helped him, and much, much more. And thank you to NoCD for supporting the podcast. NoCD offers effective and convenient therapy available in the US and outside the US. To find out more about NoCD, their therapy plans, if they currently take your insurance, or to download their free app, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or the link will be in the episode description. Thank you to all of our patrons for supporting our work. To sign up to our Patreon and to check out the other benefits you'll receive as a patron, please see the link in the show notes. So thank you to Duke for his time and of course sharing his art with us. I really appreciate it. And of course, thank you to you guys so much for listening. I appreciate all the support in 2023. I hope you have a great 2024. And without further ado, here is Duke. Welcome to the podcast, Duke. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Uh, feels awesome to be to be here. Yeah, absolutely. We we met at uh, the OCD Game Changers event in London recently, and then obviously you were at the OC Action Conference the next day as well. So it was nice to meet you finally. Obviously, I've seen you online and social media for a number of years now. So it was cool to meet and obviously have you as a guest now. Yeah, no, it was really cool to meet. Um, and both events were just awesome. Mm. And they were my first OCD events, finally, after all these years going to them. So it was sort of like a special moment for me. But yeah, really cool to meet you. And um, OCD stories I've also seen for the last few years. So it was really cool yeah. to cool to be on here. Yeah, thanks, man. No worries. So what I didn't, what I didn't say to you uh, off air was um, I'll read your bio before so everyone listening now knows what you're about and what you do. Um, so, uh, yeah, but it'd be good to hear your OCD story. Um, obviously, I've, I've heard it, um, but I'm excited to hear it again. Um, it always changes as people retell it anyway. So, um, yeah, you know, please share it now in as little as much detail as you want to give. Awesome. Uh, so I think my OCD story begins, uh, I mean, my, my, my earliest memory is around about year seven or year eight. And uh, I was very much a worrier. I was always a worrier. I was, I was young and I was just, yeah, I was just always worried about things um, to the point where, you know, when my mum would do fireworks i was crying my eyes out because i thought she was gonna like get blown up by a firework you know so like all those things i think these these are like building up to maybe what ocd eventually became uh in my life and uh i think my earliest memory was being in maths class and i was trying to do some sums when i was you know, using a biro pen, biro pen. <laughs> and when you write with a biro pen, not all of the ink comes out mm. sometimes. And that was like a huge trigger for me. And I felt like I had to, like everything had to be almost perfect. Like I had to have the ink come out. And then if it didn't come out, I would scribble over it. And then I'd get an intrusive thought. Then I scribble over it again, so on, so forth, multiple times. And I just couldn't end up, I couldn't do my maths work. So I threw my pen on the floor and I stormed out of the classroom. And the teacher, you know, was a bit surprised and walked out. And I said to her, because at the time I'd been researching OCD, this is just my big memory that I just remember. Um, and I said to her, I think I've got OCD. And she, and I, I, I was like, I don't know what's going on. Da, 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 da. 
Uh, I've always been very in tune with myself. So um, I sort of researched prior to that, like things that were going on, you know, sort of symptoms. And OCD popped up and I read it and I was like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, uh, and then I said, I think I caught OCD. So this is this is the very interesting thing. Uh, there was in my school, it was a bit weird. So year seven to nine, I was in one site, which is the smaller site, which is in Dennis Powys in Wales. And then in Penarth is the bigger site. And that's got year seven all the way up to sixth form. Um, and there was a boy in my year who was in Penarth site who got switched over to Dennis site because he was getting bullied, basically. And me and a couple of my friends were asked to look after him basically um and sort of show him around and make him feel welcome uh and make sure yeah that he's all right uh and he had ocd and was very much like you could see him doing compulsions and unfortunately you know people thought he was weird and it's really really sad to say that um and he was doing all these things and i i at then then i didn't know what ocd was um, so then I thought, yeah, I was in ma- math and I said to the teacher, I think I've caught OCD because this because this guy's got OCD. Uh, and then she sort of like giggled as in like, you can't. No, there's no way you can do that. Uh, and yeah, that's that's pretty much my first memory. Um, and I say that because. Like, yeah, it's just really imprinted in my brain about the maths and stuff, but obviously things were going on b- before then. So maybe I'll talk about that. Um, so before then, it was, uh, I remember speaking to a friend. I'm just trying to get everything out. Um, I remember speaking to a friend and he said, when I was in like year six, I used to ask him to come over my house all the time. Mm-hmm. I'm so sorry. That's my phone going off. <laughs> um, he said, when I used to ask him, I would repeat it, uh, but I would, wouldn't know I was repeating it. I used to say, do you want to come over my house tonight? And then it, my lips would go. Don't know what that was. I don't know if that's an early sign of OCD. I don't know what that was. But yeah, so like year five, year six, all these little things. And then obviously the maths thing and started having um, intrusive thoughts. Uh, and the first intrusive thoughts I remember, 12, 13 years old, were, were all about my mum. So my mum's a single mum. Used to see my dad every weekend or, or every other weekend. Love my dad to bits. Got a really good relationship with my dad now, of course. But evidently my mum was a single mum uh there's five of us two of my older siblings one of them lives in north wales uh, and they've got different dads but obviously still say they're my siblings and the other one now lives away but she lived with us for a bit and then it was my other two siblings so yeah there's, there's quite a lot going on we grew up on a housing association uh mum's still there now you know didn't my mum's amazing a rock but we we, we never really had a huge amount of money thing we did struggle a little bit but as i said my mum's just amazing and she eventually did did, didn't did an accountancy course and got got a job um but the reason i'm painting this picture is because the worst thing that could have ever happened to me was something happening to my mum so um yeah my intrusive thoughts were all about you know my mum's gonna die in a car crash if i don't do this when something's gonna happen to my mum if i don't do that um i'm trying to piece everything together as i go sorry but I also went to Sunday school from a young age. <clears throat> and in Sunday school, uh, you learn about sin at a very young age. <laughs> yeah. And um, and you learn, you know, you learn about the Bible. And by the way, I'm a Christian and, and you know, I believe that. But, but as maybe a young person who was about to experience horrendous OCD, um, it was very difficult for me. So... I've even spoken about this before. Uh, when when you're such a young, uh, such a young impression impressionable age, I think talking about sin in uh, a, quite a deep way, saying oh you're not allowed to do anything wrong because it's a sin, mm-hmm. it can really affect people. Um, you know, because nobody is perfect, and I believe that really affected me. Uh, so yeah, so my compulsions. I'm telling you this because my p- compulsions became prayer. So repetitive praying in my head and repetitive prayers uh, for different intrusive thoughts. And I would say them a certain number of times because then numbers start to kick in. I then associated the number six as bad because. As I'm not going to say the 
you know what i'm saying right yeah. um and then i started association associating other things that maybe i've i've seen uh maybe it maybe it was like a piece on the news and something horrendous was on the news and and then i associated like the sound of a number with things so i got to a point where like no there was hardly any good numbers anymore <clears throat> So when I do my repetitive prayers, I'd oh, I'd have to hit that number, and if I didn't quite do it well enough, or I got interrupted, I would start again, and I'd start again, and it was exhausting, and it was tiring, and it was frustrating, and I felt like I was a bad person. Um, I was, you know, obviously worried initially. You know, these intrusive thoughts w- would happen, and my mum would die, and it'd be my fault. But more so, it's just like feeling like I was a sinner and a bad person. Um. And that was that was extremely challenging. So that was that's how how it really started, I guess. Um, and then, should I go on, or do you want to? Ask yeah, keep going. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to interrupt. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would say that's the basis of my OCD, and it still is today. I still repetitively pray. Mm. Uh, however, I like to say this because I am a Christian. When I pray and I mean this prayer, <laughs> and I pray properly, should we say it's different because I know when it's a compulsion and when it's not and i think it's important to make that clear yeah. uh but yeah i i did it i started um started to go through the ages should we say <laughs> and uh what was there for me was poetry and rhyme um 12 13 years old i started writing poetry and rhyme when, and raps when i was about 11 years old by 12 13 years old it became a self therapy as as we all know you know ocds tremendously isolating <laughs> uh, and it's really really sad that it's so isolating you know I didn't want to tell anybody when I was 12 13 about these horrendous things yeah. obviously in the maths class I did eventually but and that was just one little moment I still basically dealt with it on my own for years and years and years um, but yeah me being able to write about it was extremely therapeutic and uh, it, not only therapeutic I could sort of understand it more I was able to like figure it out it's like as I was writing, I was able to understand sort of these deep intrusive thoughts and these compulsions and try and I was trying to make sense of them. Um, afraid of stigma, afraid of if, if people found out, I would hide hide my rhymes. Nobody would ever see them. <laughs> it was they were just for me. And yeah, that that pretty much I was I've always said, you know, it saved my life, I think, because it was with me for so long until I eventually got help, which I will get to. Um but yeah, the other coping mechanism then was a negative coping mechanism, which was alcohol. I started drinking from a very young age. I think I remember my first time being drunk and spewing everywhere. I think I was 12 oh, wow. uh, at Boxing Day family party. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but even then, I remember before I did all that, I remember sitting next to my dad and saying, Dad, I something's going on like I don't know what's going on in my head like I, I feel this and that I just, I just didn't understand it and there was there was drink around and I was a kid and I was sneaking sneakily like going in the back and necking some cans and going to the back and obviously that must be and stuff mm. that sort of stayed with me for a long time um you know started drinking with my, with my mates down the park with cans as we do at 14 years old yeah. um you know, in the pub by getting served at by 15, 16, uh, and then youth rugby. I played a lot of rugby, played a lot of sports, so started youth rugby. And, uh, you know, I was a, I was good. I was good at rugby. I was decent, decent player. And I thought it was all about being a tough, a tough guy who can tackle the hardest, who can run the fastest. And unfortunately, it, it evidently came clear, it became clear to me that rugby as soon as you hit youth and, and was introduced to alcohol and it wasn't only about being good on the pitch it was about being a lad should we say off the pitch um so yeah that binge drink culture is is massive in rugby and as much as rugby is a community i do think the binge drink culture and probably now the drug culture there wasn't much of a drug culture when i was younger but i believe it is now i think it's ruining the game mm. but the reason why i'm saying this is because um when I when I'd have a drink, um, we've got like serotonin in our bellies, I believe. So I, I I felt good for a bit, and then and then I felt 
as though I had power over my OCD, which is, as you know, very rare. <laughs> um, so I just began to sort of say no to the compulsions and became quite aggressive towards myself. Mm. So and then I drink more, I drink more, and I'm like, no, I'm not doing this. And then all of these, all of the anxiety and all of these frustrations that I probably hold in and just, just were just pouring out of me. And I unfortunately got into, over the years, got into quite a bit of trouble in terms of fights. And mm. I got arrest, arrested at one point. Um, and uh, when I was 21, uh, this is when my OCD was getting really, really bad, extremely bad. And, and also, you know, things have changed by then, you know, different intrusive thoughts. I was struggling with POCD, which I think still been the worst thing I've ever experienced. Uh, and, um, you know, I wasn't just praying in my head repetitively. I was doing check. I was checking things, uh, you know, walking in and out of my doors, uh, walking in and out of rooms, turning light switches on and off. Um, trying to think back false memory, maybe, maybe real and OCD thinking back about, oh, was I an idiot then? Did I do that then? Um, yeah, so loads and loads of themes and different forms of OCD I started to experience. So it was an extremely difficult time for me. And um, I was out, I think it was Wales, England, rugby. Um, got very drunk. <laughs> uh, and I remember walking home. So the next day, we, my mum was meant to drive up to North Wales because my little nephew was about to get christened. And all I could think of was my mum, like, maybe crashing the car or something. But then I was also struggling with, as I said, POCD. So I just had these, in, I just had these horrendous intrusive thoughts. And I just, I didn't have a clue how to deal with them. I, you know, I, I've been writing, which has been really helpful. This is, you know, it's been going on for like nearly ten years now. I've been, you know, I've been drinking and now drinking, sort of doing, becoming the thing that I'm doing more often. And I was just so drunk, and I thought, all I want to hear, I'm just fed up with this noise. Just, I just need silence. Um, so I saw a taxi coming towards me and I was like, let's do it. So I walked in, timed it perfectly into the middle of the road and I got hit by the taxi. I smashed the windscreen, face smashed on the concrete floor and I just laid there and I did hear silence. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I wouldn't want anybody to get to that deep, dark place for them to hear silence. They should hopefully um, I would encourage them to talk about it before that happens. But yeah, I remember laying in the middle of the road, very fortunate not to be in seriously injured because i was so drunk i just bounced off the car um and yeah and i and i heard silence and then i wasn't allowed to move i think there was a nurse in the back of the taxi and she told me not to move they got an ambulance and all that and as i said i was absolutely fine apart from a scratch on my face it's really weird uh very lucky very blessed and um yeah. through that i saw i saw finally saw a psychiatrist and uh they then um what's the word uh gave me access to the ocd specialists and then i went on a 10-week group therapy course so once a week for 10 weeks met other people with ocd which i was very frightened about because i thought i was then going to catch their ocd and realized that's not a thing <laughs> um and yeah i had cognitive behavioral therapy exposure ref response therapy uh, really just sort of understood the condition, was able to view it from a new perspective, understood I'm not this horrendously bad person that I thought I might have been, and that all these things, after all these years, all these little things that I've done wrong, these things that I think are sins, and me beating myself up for them and giving myself constant self-punishment, yeah, I realised that it was... Uh, you know, it's, it's all it's all linked. It's all part of OCD, and I think that was a huge turning point. Knowing that, and yeah, that therapy I think also saved my life. That was just amazing. I don't know what I would have done without that therapy. I don't know where I'd be now. Um, I I need to mention this actually. When I was, I think when I was about fifteen or sixteen, I did go to cams for a little bit, and as helpful as it was, because I did eventually open up to my mum and Taller and stuff and and things like that. Um, and she was really helpful, really supportive. So, uh, you know, as as was my dad with that. But CAMS never really got me the specific OCD intervention that I needed. It was good to like speak to them and get some help. 
but it was never quite the thing I needed. Yeah. So I don't want to say cams are bad, but I'm not also saying cams are fantastic. I'm just saying it was good oh, yeah. for me to get stuff off my chest. Um, but yeah, it wasn't quite specific what I needed. Did they know uh, it was OCD at the time when you went at 15? They like, they were I, I can't remember if they diagnosed me or not, but I think they were very sure it was. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I've that time's such a blur to me. I can't really remember if they hmm. diagnosed me or not. Um, I don't know. I really I can't I can't answer that question. But you know, I'm not saying they weren't helpful because they were, but as I said, it wasn't fully what I needed. And then when you leave CAMS, you just there's nothing happens. You just dropped again, 18 years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, like it's been really, it's, it's hard to tell the story because there's so many things to say uh, I've not said. Um, like it affected my school work really badly. Um, you know, you want to succeed in school, but revising was was hard enough as it is. But with OCD, revising was just a nightmare. Like it was really hard to revise for your, G- for your GCSEs. Um, I've always wanted to do well, and I've always been the type of person that thinks like, "Oh, if other people see, you know, what grades I get, you know, what are they going to think of me?" When I was younger, and then I, you know, I did my GCSEs. I got to sixth form. I didn't want to be in sixth form. I went there just because all my mates went there. Uh, and at the time, like our school was falling apart. They've got a new building now, and there were portal cabins everywhere because it was a massive leak. It just wasn't the nicest environment to be in. Um, so yeah, I failed sixth form. And then I said to myself, Oh, I'll just redo it because I was trying to like please my mum. And then I failed it again. And then eventually went to college, which was which was good. But during that time in sixth form with OCD, I remember like writing a business studies exam. And I wrote a poem about about how how I was feeling. But I just didn't give the paper in, I just took it home and somewhere in my collection of poems. <laughs> Uh, yeah there's so much to talk about in terms of ocd um the, the big thing for me as well was was rugby so i got into the cardiff blues development squad when i was 16 which is you know decent um along with a couple of my friends and i passed the training and i got in there you know a couple of my friends dropped out um but the reason why i, I dropped out was because ocd like weaved into rugby I actually I liked playing rugby and I, as I said I was good at it um but I started to have like intrusive thoughts of well, what if I hurt somebody when I tackle them or maybe like maybe I'm not allowed to tackle them because that's bad and then I'd have um intrusive thoughts in my head just during the game and I'd have to finish my compulsions in my head before I could then play the game so people were calling me slow and like as in terms of like slow to react and like in my own world i got shouted at by coaches uh because i just couldn't concentrate on the game i was just constantly constantly doing compulsions and massive triggers for me are swear words swear words are huge triggers to me and in rugby swear words are every single second of the game um so i so uh when i pray for a compulsion i felt i i felt i needed to ask forgiveness for that person for swearing uh, so that was just, I was just constantly, constantly doing compulsions on the pitch. And, uh, you know, I can pick up a ball now and run into somebody and tackle somebody fine because I've got over that bit. But that I did I did actually quit the Blues Development Squad because of that. And I quit rugby for a, for a little time because of that as well. Um, uh, and then, like, the C word is is horrendous because I think it's the worst swear word. And because I think it's the worst swear word, <laughs> it's it's become and to this still to this day, unfortunately, it it become a massive part of my OCD. <clears throat> so my OCD thinks of the C word and thinks it's linked to like it's linked to the number one because it sort of rhymes with it. Mm. Which means eleven, maybe. 21 31 all of those things yeah and then what my ocd does with that word is is the worst thing that i i possibly could think of it of of it it happening which is why it does it it unfortunately takes that word and targets it at god and then it's like i feel horrendous thinking like like of course i'd never call 
God, that horrible word. Of course, I wouldn't do that. Oh, my days. It makes me feel absolutely disgraceful and disgusting. And the amount of compulsions I feel I have to do just to get rid of that one intrusive thought for years and years and years has been horrendous. Um, but I've got to a place now where I feel God knows I have OCD and knows I don't mean any of these things. Mm-hmm. And it's become, it's become a, a, it has become a little bit easier. But yeah, I'm just trying to paint the picture, you know. So all numbers, I can go through numbers if you want. You know, number two, mm. I think means paedophile. Number three, I associate it sometimes with six, which six means the devil. Mm. Four is like de- de- decapitation. Five is, um, um, oh, I forgot what five is. Six, as I said, seven's a good number for me. Okay. Eight represents death. Uh, at the moment, nine's good for me, but it never used to be. Ten is like fam- a family member, and I wouldn't want anything bad to happen to them. Eleven uh, is at the moment good for me. Twelve is, um, you know, it could be something associated with God. Thirteen is good because I was born on the thirteenth. Seven, uh, fourteen is okay because seven plus seven is fourteen. 15, I think it's paedophilia. 16's linked to 6. 17 is now good because it's linked to my relationship. 18's linked to the devil because 3 times 6 is 18. 19, <laughs> I'll just go up to 20. Yeah. I don't like 19 for some reason, and 20 is a bit tricky for me as well, but I can't remember the exact things at the moment what they are. But yeah, that's well, I'm just yeah. I'm just trying to paint a picture of yeah. what OCD is. But I don't know who I don't know if anybody who doesn't have OCD might listen to this. Um, but yeah, also reading. So when I read, I I love reading, but I don't read because it's just too stressful for me. I'll pick up a book, and I'll read a sentence. I'll have an intrusive thought, and then I'll have to read it twenty times. And I'm like, and it's just so tiring and exhausting. And if there's profanity or swear words in there it's very difficult for me to read them um and sometimes i get triggered just by a letter like letters can also have various intrusive thoughts attached to them so it's yeah it just it, it, ocd is it, i used to think ocd was a monster then he was a bully and i've written a song called bully and now i think ocd is more of a parasite because it gets it gets into every little cracks, any anything it can sort of wiggle through. It will just, it'll get there and it'll try and um, throw an influenza on whatever that thing is. So reading at the moment is very difficult for me, um, which is annoying because I'm a poet and I should read more. <laughs> and that should, that would probably help me. Um, uh, but, audio books? Or does that have the same? No, I, can't, I can't do that. No, I can't do audio books. Yeah. I struggle a lot hmm. because I struggle with the person who's reading it, who's reading it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, my OCD as well is like if if I'm not familiar with the person or I don't know who the person is, I don't really like or I don't like them. For example, yeah, <laughs> I don't want their voice in my head because I don't want to okay. be them. Yeah, that makes sense. I don't want to yeah, become anything else. Cool. I only want to be me. I only ever want to be me. And so I've had stuff like that as well, which is really hard. Which has been really hard yeah um the gym so uh again you know i you know as i said i played a lot of sport i did a sports i did a ooh, there. i did a sports coaching degree so sorry i went to, so after sixth form when i failed it twice i went to college and i did sports coaching and fitness as a b-tech did that for two years i then did um a personal training course uh, to do a level two gym instructor and then a personal training course Level two gym instructor was night school. Then it was a year to do personal training. So I was a personal trainer for three years and I coached people and, you know, I had clients and things like that and tried to look after myself. And I did a sports coaching degree. Um, but OCD got into training really bad. <clears throat> so I felt like it was easier for me not to look after myself and not train as a self punishment for my intrusive thoughts. And then what, so, so, so say I did have an intrusive thought or say I went out and I got really drunk and I felt guilty for being drunk and I, I, you know, or something bad happened that night. I didn't deserve to then on Monday morning, wake up and go to the gym. 
so I battled I think I battled that for around 10 years um and also it had to be on the correct day of the week slash date slash time slash an almost impossible task and all I all I wanted to do was train like I wanted to look after myself I wanted to sort of reach my full physical potential that's all I wanted to do but um it became a self-punishment so I, I guess you know self-punishment can be a compulsion and that's basically what happened um but yeah after my sports coaching degree it took me to Zambia for six weeks where I coached underprivileged children in Zambia and I also worked with their elite athletes and worked in their the OIDC so Olympic Youth Development Centre mm. and even though it's their Olympic Development Centre you know the the facilities compared to here mm. you know are far unfortunately they're, they're not as good and it's just really sad because there's so much talent in Zambia they're so talented and they want to learn anyway that's just really sad but it was a fantastic experience and I coached the under 18s hockey team I coached a judo athlete named Simon Zulu and I did sort of their um build up to the youth olympic games so when I left two weeks later they went to the youth olympics they both came fourth which is cool yeah. um not not just down to me at all by the way because <laughs> I don't play the game but I was a tiny 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 it was a tiny bit of part of that which is cool but I also saw the extreme po- poverty side of it and coached very young very young children you know they're running up to me with dust on their skin no shoes on their feet but a big grin on their face because they wanted to play football mm-hmm. so it's an amazing experience and the reason why i'm telling you this is because there was a leader out there his name's jp and at the time i was you know as i said i was a personal trainer just finished my degree i was out there with the university and i was thinking what am i going to do when i get home and i had a little chat with him and he was currently doing, he was then doing a master's in international development. And I was just blown away. I was like, well, how on earth did you decide you want to do that? Because when you do a master's, that's your thing, right? Uh, so I said, yeah, what made you decide to do that? And he said, he asked himself two things. What makes him get out of bed in the morning? And what does he love? And he said he loves playing basketball because he used to play for Wales, for example. But what what makes him get out of bed in the morning? was making a positive impact in people's lives so I did the same I did the same process to myself I thought I do love coaching because I'm making a positive impact however what makes me get out of bed in the morning are, is my poetry I was still writing poetry just not shown anybody I was 23 by the way um my poetry my raps and I thought I want to make a positive impact with them because I believe in them you know I don't just write about OCD I write about loads of different things politics racism I've written about um I, yeah write about loads of things so um a year later i then set up my instagram and then started finally sharing my work and a very very early poem was called demented which was about ocd uh, so that's why i'm telling you that story um i'm, I'm mixing my story up so oh, yeah my head's all over the place at the minute sorry um but just before i went to zambia i got diagnosed with type 1 diabetes so basically, really quick story about that. Me and my fiance, my now fiance, went to Thailand and Bali. And in Bali, uh, we stayed in Ubud, which is near the Monkey Forest, which is really cool. But I remember going into a surf and turf restaurant and I picked up a shrimp and I put it in my mouth. I surf, sorry, surf and turf restaurant. I went to a restaurant and ordered a surf and turf. I picked up a, a shrimp, I put it in my mouth. It tasted horrendous. I spat it out and I thought in my head, I think that shrimp was definitely gone off. <laughs> mm. uh, so for the next seven or so days, I think we had about 10 days left. I slowly started to feel ill and I've had sunstroke before and I thought, oh no, oh no, I'm, I'm going to get sunstroke again. I'm thinking, oh no, you know, I want to enjoy myself here. So I was, I was, you know, putting the paracetamol in and I was still, you know, drinking away alcohol just to try and enjoy, my, enjoy myself. But on the flight home, my head started to really pound and then the three hour journey from London back to Cardiff, back to Wales, you know, it was even worse. And then for the next two days, I was living with my mum at the time. Uh, I was trying to sort of sweat it all out with, with day and night nurse, you know, medication and tablets. And I was just sweating loads and I, and my temperature was high. And my mum said, you, you, need, you need to go to the doctor's like really bad. So, so I went up and they took one look at my temperature. And then sent me straight to the infectious disease unit 
So basically, I had salmonella, and they found out. It took them a while, and I'm and I mean like maybe months to find out what type of salmonella I had. About a month or two it took them. And it was called type two Java salmonella, and Java's like in Indonesia region region. But because I'd waited so long, it got into my blood. So I basically had sepsis. So I was on an intravenous line for six weeks with antibiotics, and then within about a, within a year then i had a slow transition into type 1 diabetes they believe that was a, for the first trigger and then it was i was in my last year of university somebody ripped my car off and i got into an altercation which i won't talk about but it left me with a little bit of ptsd and then bam type 1 diabetes and the reason why i'm telling you this is because um that then that then weaved itself into my ocd um but i'm not gonna tell you about that i'm gonna let my poem tell you about that nice. is that okay yeah, go for it. I've got a poem called Perfect. It's actually called Perfect Part Two because Perfect initially was just about in my other diabetes thing that I've done <laughs> uh, poem, but this is called Perfect Part Two. Perfect. Trying to be perfect is like running on a glass bridge with metal spikes. Walking on a frozen lake with no ice, tiptoeing on a tightrope from a high height. Trying to be perfect is like a relentless fight, shadow boxing against my mind. I've boxed up doubt. I fear if I let it out, I will live in the shadow of me. Myself is complicated, this fight against my health. Trying to be perfect is on the edge of failure. On the edge of failure is self-punishment. On the edge of self-punishment is self-destruction. On the edge of self-destruction is imperfection. A cycle of nothing but stress. Nothing but putting pressure on myself to only feel worth less. But is being perfect worth stress? Tormenting thoughts. I'm in a continuous war. With no warning they spawn, I try to ignore them. They take a new form. I sit and I draw up all the conclusions if the thought actually forms. I'm having withdrawals, compulsions, I mourn, I'm shattered, I yawn, I'm battered, I'm worn, bags live under my eyes, it's as if somebody is gripping, somebody is ripping my stomach, my body is torn, I grip my teeth, I cannot be besides myself, because that means I'll be the shadow, then OCD's one. I need to inject, but the numbers are wrong, how can I go on? Do I inject too little, too many, nothing's perfect, I'm gone. Obsession, injection, compulsion, injection, bad number, rejection, obsession, rejection, compulsion, injection, perfection, I'm testing, I'm checking, is it between the four and the seven, bad number, rejection, bad number, rejection, bad number, neglect, bad number, eject, high blood, forget, bad thought, upset, bad head, feel dead, no tears are shed, I'm numb, imperfect, I'm numb, imperfect, I'm numb, imperfect. Wait, what did I say? What if I made the word appear different, a slightly different shape, then my perspective might change? Put an apostrophe in between the I and M, then just add a space. What does it say? I'm perfect in my own imperfect way. This gift, do I deserve it? To use rhymes to articulate how my body, my brain, my heart feels. God gave me this gift as my escape. When I write things down, my endorphins are doing cartwheels. It is the powerful way I communicate. Maybe God gave me this gift to also help others. Maybe I needed to have suffered to pick up the pen and, em and empty bad thoughts from my brain so others relate and it soothes their pain. Because I'm, I'm obsessed with words. I'm blessed, not cursed. These condi conditions are my test on earth. OCD, all the checks I'm urged to complete. When I'm wrecked, I turn to T1D. All the checks I'm urged to complete. A relentless surge of energy. But through stress, I've learned to accept my terms. Not had a rest since birth. But I won't rest till I'm dead in the dirt. Forget these nerves i'm gonna work on myself as i set my goals and write my notes before i'm ghost i'm gonna be the best person i can be forget perfection i'm just gonna be the best version of me nice that is perfect that's awesome i love it and the reason why i'm saying that is because um so with where's my pen so with insulin you load up the barrel and there's numbers and what's a big part of my ocd <laughs> numbers <Yeah. laughs> um so, you know, I have to inject certain numbers. So every, for every 10 grams of carbohydrate, I inject one unit of insulin. But if I'm having a bad day and OCD wants to attack a number or attach itself to a number, it's very, very difficult for me to inject the insulin. 
do I need the insulin? Otherwise, my blood sugar levels are too high. Um, so before, um, when I was at a bad stage with my diagnosis, because, you know, it's a bit of a life changing diagnosis, um, I would sometimes, because it was just easier for me to inject too many. So if I inject too many units, I would rapidly need carbohydrates. Otherwise, I'll go really low into a hypo hypoglycemia, which is dangerous. Or I'd just inject too little and then float around in hyperglycemia, so too high. So I did really battle with it. And there's this sort of perfection thing with uh, with, di- with type 1 diabetes, where you have to stay in between 4 and 7, your blood glucose levels between 4 and 7. So there was that part, part of it. And then there was the OCD part of it. Perfect. And not like perfect uh, in excuse me in in the sense of like like i don't know my desk needs to look perfect yeah. and not not perfectionist but perfect in terms of i cannot start a new thing that is going to be good for me unless all of my compulsions are completed there's no intrusive thoughts the number of the day is the correct day da, 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 da. and i mean that in that as yeah being perfect so that poem has really helped me because understanding that you know nothing like it's gonna it's so difficult to be perfect it is literally walking on a tightrope all the time you know and it's just not it's yeah that poem's helped me and i hope it helps some other people that it's okay for things not to be perfect and start things um yeah nice. sorry my, my story has just been here there and everywhere today I, that's good oh head over the place but there we are yeah. So, um, well, look, thank you. Thank you for your spoken word. And obviously, thank you for your story. Um, I knew that there was a lot in here that you've shared that I haven't heard, you know, and I, I've heard you say it twice before, you know, both the, both the events we mentioned earlier, you did it right. And um, so even more came out here. So I'm honored to to hear it. Um, I'm trying to think. So I think I know the answer to this, but with alcohol, you, you're teetotal now, like you don't drink. No, do I do drink? drink now. Okay. And I I try and drink in moderation. Okay, cool. I'm not. I'll be completely real with you though. Like I do have the odd slip up. I'm not going to say mm-hmm. I don't. Cause I do. Yeah. But I'm far, far, far better than I was. My relationship with alcohol is far better than it was. Um, you know, I I know when to stop, and I can stop. Yeah. Uh, and I don't drink as often. However, going forward, I I personally like a goal of mine. I don't know when this will happen. Uh, I would love to be teetotal one day. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, and and with therapy, so you did that, was it 10-week group therapy course? Yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. 10 weeks. I've done it okay. twice. Oh, twice. Okay, cool. I had, to, I had to do it about five or six years later because, you know, was, I was 21. I had that therapy and then I just cracked on for five, six years and then yeah. things happened again. <laughs> so I yeah. did it again. Okay. Uh, cool. I had a relapse. I would like a... I had my first ever sort of panic attack and uh okay basically the old job i was in it was just just crap and mm. i had a bit of difficulty with some people in that job um and just yeah just things got on top of me and i, I desperately needed help again i actually paid for private therapy while i was waiting as well because i was just so desperate yeah and that was a few years ago all right okay okay cool um so obviously writing helps you uh therapy helped you is there anything else that you would consider in your kind of toolkit for ocd 100 percent. um i've got seven things actually oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> sorry <Pretty prepared>. we... <laughs> yeah. I'm joking. um but before i say these seven things uh i don't do these seven things like every week or every day i think it's really important for people to understand that to not put pre- put pressure on yourself to do these things I think if you try and weave at least, you know, maybe one or two, eat three of them into your weekly schedule or monthly schedule, maybe that can help. So my seven things are, um, first of all, sorry, I was doing a compulsion in my head. I might as well tell you because we're doing a OCD podcast. Um, um, First of all, uh, where should we start? Let's start with uh, food. (laughs) I try, you know, if I can eat, good foods um and and you know the less sugar i eat or the less you know binge bad foods i eat 
it, you know, you are what you eat. If you eat junk food, you're going to feel like junk, right? So mm-hmm. that's important. It's important to me. Um, sleep. I need, I, I really need my eight hours. I'm one of those people who needs eight hours. Mm-hmm. Um, the more tired I am, the more difficult it is to say, OCD, no, I'm not doing those compulsions. I'm going to actually crack on with my day. If I'm really tired, yeah, that's hard. And then I, I end up doing more compulsions. OCD is harder to manage. And also type 1 diabetes is harder to manage when I'm tired. Third one is exercise, and that's been key for me. Uh, so recently, I say recently, last year and a half. So this is still very fresh. Last year and a half, I've been going to the gym consistently for a year and a half, where before it would be like three months, and then I'd say, no, I'm not allowed it, you know, self punishment. And that's CrossFit. CrossFit is a massive community. Um, I'm not saying people have to do CrossFit, but I'm just telling you, again, it's part of my story. The CrossFit community have been extremely helpful. Uh, they're really supportive. You meet all walk, you meet all walks of life there, and uh, they do like events and stuff. And throughout the year, and it's a huge community, and it's kept me going. And it's kept me even when I'm struggling. I'm I'm going to go to the gym and work out with a lovely group of, group of people. So that's been really really beneficial for me for uh, for my mental health for OCD. It's been it's been amazing. And as I said, year and a half now, I've been going consistently. And that has taken me, as I said, about 10 years to get to. So that's huge for me. Um, number four, uh, I would say nature. I love nature. And if I could get out in it more, I would. But I believe, you know, you walk through the trees and it's going to heal you in terms of, um, uh, I don't know, if I go through a walk th- through through the woods, when I'm in the woods, I feel energetic because I feel like the trees give me energy. It's peaceful. It's calming. And then when I come home, I want to sleep because then I want to rest. It's like it's that nice sort of thing, you know. Yeah. You know, any sort of nature. I think get out. Yeah, get out. Um, definitely. I think number five is creativity in any sort of shape or form. You know, it could be drawing, it could be sculpting, it could be knitting. For me, it's poetry. Mm-hmm. For you, it could be something else. Give it a go. Express yourself, and be real, raw, honest, open and um and free and just allow yourself to in any sort of way get out whatever's in you just just get it out in a, in a creative way and you've also got something then as well to say oh i was feeling bad but and this is what happened but look this you know maybe this could help you type thing again it could you could be just for you though it doesn't have to help others number six is um i feel like human beings in general uh are, are, like generally have passion and generally have meaning and want to do something meaningful i think for me that's been hugely empowering and hugely important to find something of meaning so my job also consists of doing a lot of workshops um, with the community Uh, i go into schools i work with i've worked with adult mental health services i've worked with substance misuse the deaf community so on so forth I've worked with a lot of people um, doing, putting on poetry workshops and creative writing workshops. And also I feel, you know, the poems that I write are meaningful. So find something of meaning in your life and try and do more of it, I guess. Yeah. And then uh, number seven is, oh, I'm getting lost now. What have I said? I said exercise, sleep, food, passion, creativity, nature talking um yeah talking find somebody or anybody or even if it's a helpline you know just talk 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 to somebody how you're feeling get off your chest Mm -hmm. have a chat um and if that if that means have cognitive behavioral therapy and talk out you know what i mean so talking is also therapy isn't it um Mm -hmm. they're my sort of seven things that if i could do every week would be wonderful but i try and do you know as much as i can yeah awesome well you know like the obviously finding a sense of meaning and purpose is so important um and and you know what you're saying about nature that's fully backed by science you know the japanese were like 30 40 years probably like 40 years ago started researching because they knew that loads of people were really unwell because they were working too hard post-war they were trying to rebuild japan and all of that and uh, and they've even got a word for people that die at work. You know, that's how bad it got in their culture. I can't remember the name of it. Wow. Um, 
yeah it's messed up but i think it's changing a little bit now but anyway so they they thought well what do we have a lot of and we have a lot of trees i think japan's like something like 70 percent forest i could be slightly increasing that number but it's a large number Mm. and then so they started researching well what are the benefits of being in nature and they created shinrin yoku which is forest bathing basically Uh, and they say within two hours of being in a woodland or in nature and by rivers and all of this they found that the benefit on anxiety and stress is massive. The benefit on um, increasing natural killer cells, which like fight off things like cancers and things like that, increase wow. just from two hours. Um, so it's pretty amazing. And they've spent decades, millions researching this. And I think also somewhere like Sweden has also looked into it. But so, yeah, it's, I just wanted to share that it's not woo woo or out there. Like what you're experiencing is actually backed by data. Well, that's amazing, and and it makes sense because we're all living organisms on the same earth. Yeah. So you know everything connects in some shape or form, doesn't it? So yeah, yeah, like the yeah, essential no. oils the trees give off calm us. Um, yeah. The fractal patterns of the branches calm us. Like it's yeah. Loads of other examples. But... They say if you talk to trees as well. <laughs> I'm not sure if you've heard that. I don't know if that's it's... been backed by science, but I, I mean, don't know I that. Do. <laughs> I talk uh, yeah, to I'll my have, plants in my room. I'll, I'll have a chat to a plant. Yeah, I love it. Mm. <laughs> you know, and you know, feel a feel a tree and get you know feel the energy and stuff. I, I yeah, there's something there, man. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, love exactly. It. Um, nice, but I like those examples. And yeah, you're right to say like we can't always get to everything every week, and if we tried, we'd probably stress ourselves out, which is counterproductive anyway. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that yeah, that's cool um but yeah so with your spoken word uh and like the workshop and stuff is this full-time for you now is that your your job yeah it's been full-time now for about a year and a half oh good for you uh, yeah I'm, I'm loving it it's just been the best thing i've ever dis- i've ever done yeah you know i took the leap i wasn't even worried about taking the leap because i was so ready to leave that other job yeah but also, you know, the last few years I've been sort of building up a little bit of a profile in terms of just getting my work out there and people mm-hmm. who are extremely gracious and kind saying lovely things, which is nice, and the odd commission here and there. So, yeah, I was ready just to give it a go, and it's been the best decision I've ever made. So I'm really happy, man. Amazing. Amazing. Good. Yeah, I love to see people chasing their dreams and grabbing them. Um, so... Yeah. Uh, let me think so was there like i'm sure there was many but was there like a big roadblock for you in your recovery and if so how did you sort of overcome it a roadblock in in a cover in recovery in, in recovery yeah something that was like getting in your way or or making it difficult hmm it's a good question um Probably like um, overthinking. I'm not gonna. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you what they were because I. I don't feel comfortable in doing that. But um, mm-hmm. overthinking maybe some events that that have happened um, years ago, and wondering and trying to work out exactly what happened in those events. Mm-hmm. That's been tra- challenging. Because yeah. constantly linking that to me being this horrendous person, I would say that was very challenging. So they saw a real event, OCD. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, really, that was really difficult. That is tough to to deal with. That's yeah, something I've experienced. Yeah, have you experienced it? Yeah, yeah, it will still flare up now from time to time. <laughs> I have to like use yeah. my skills and not get pulled into revisiting memories and analyzing them and yeah, otherwise exactly. you just go into hell and um yeah it's horrible it's also like I, it's, it's even hard just even mentioning it just on this it's just like yeah, yeah it's something it out. unfortunately it's it's i do yeah i don't i don't i don't really like talking about it but it's just yeah but i'm just trying to be open <laughs> Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Well, well, good, good work bringing it up. Um, so, uh, yeah, just words of hope for anyone listening. You know, 
that are going for OCD or going for OCD and diabetes. I'm sure there's someone else listening with that combination. Um, Definitely. Um, just anything you want to say? I would say really quick before I do do that, that okay. I think the, um, the religious OCD, yeah. which is still very much there, has also been extremely challenging and was potentially a bit of a block as well. A bit, not a block, okay. but a roadblock that I had to get over. And me finally like understanding that I think the biggest thing for me was accepting that God knows I have, o- I have OCD. Yeah. So rather that helped me change my perspective. Yeah. Like he knows I don't want to do these horrendous things. Yeah. Or I don't want these things to happen. Uh, and the way I look at it now is, you know, very similar to what I said in that poem. And this is, you know, you you might completely disagree, but I'm just going to say what I, I believe hmm. and uh, we'll roll with it. Uh, I do. I personally believe that. Like that human beings are. How do I say this in a nice in the best way possible? Um, I believe we've got our challenges on Earth, put it that put it that way, and our own individual challenges. And I believe that through those challenges, and let me tell you now, as you know, OCD has been the challenge of my life. Mm-hmm. Type one diabetes, yes, I've got it injected up every day. You know, it sucks, mm-hmm. but you know, it is like you know, and let me tell you, OCD is the cha- is is the challenge. <laughs> I've said that as well, you know, with people with type 1 diabetes, you know, it is what it is. Um, I believe we're all given challenges on this earth. Uh, But the biggest thing that we are also given is free will. Mm. And we have the choice, evidently, and we have the free will to deal with these challenges the best that we possibly, best that we can. And and through, through suffering, and there is suffering, like OCD is so suffering. And I know that word these days, people don't like to use that word. They don't like to use the word struggle. But no, it's it's you suffer. If you've got OCD, you suffer. Mm-hmm. But through suffer through suffering, and this is in the Bible as well, by the way, is that there's a verse in the Bible. Suffering teaches perseverance. And perseverance is a powerful thing. And uh yeah, so I believe I believe that really. I believe we're all given these challenges on challenges on earth. But evidently, we have free will on how we how we decide to manage them, uh, and that's not easy, you know. And that's the point of it; <laughs> it's not meant to be easy. Uh, would I give OCD back? No. Would I say I want to restart my life and not have OCD? No, because I wouldn't be where I am now. I wouldn't have gone to the OCD Action Conference and spoke, and hopefully, hopefully, been a positive impact for some people there. But I had to go through all that horrible stuff to get to there. Yeah. So yes. Yeah, so so when so if we're thinking about purpose and things like that, yes, I do think things are done for a purpose, and that's just the way I look at it. And maybe that's a way to look at it for somebody who's who is struggling with it, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, I mean, the, the advice I would give is the first advice I would give is to talk. You 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 have to talk it out. Mm-hmm. There will be no intrusive thought that you've had, even even people without OCD that have probably not had. <laughs> Um, and that's the biggest thing that stops us from talking. We think these thoughts are vile and disgusting. Listen, paedophile OCD is horrendous. It is horrendous. It's the most horrendous thing ever. And there's people who are not going to understand it, unfortunately, because of the stigma attached to it. Which means you've got to, you know, you've got to speak to people that are going to understand you and maybe understand OCD. So obviously, be selective with who you talk to. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't talk about it. You need you need to get these things off your chest. Um, we all have these horrendous intrusive thoughts, whether you have OCD or not, I believe. Um, and it's just the way, unfortunately, we respond to them. So you're not alone. You're not alone with those intrusive thoughts. And the quicker you start talking about them and start getting them off your chest, it's the quicker you're going to get the help that you need, whether it be cognitive behavioral therapy, exposure response therapy, I don't know. But it's the quicker you're going to hopefully recover or or go into recovery. Sorry, um, I think that's my biggest advice. You just you got to take that leap and you got to talk. Yeah, good advice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
And then, you know, if we could pick up the phone and call the 20 year old you, what would you <laughs> tell him? Or oh, if you call the 20 year old me, um, I'd probably tell him, uh, put down the drink, hmm. keep, keep writing and go and talk, go, go, go and find help now because you're about to do something very silly and it's about, you're about to hit your old time low. Um, you need to, you need to sort that out. You need to go and tell somebody exactly what's happening in your head right now. Hmm. It's talking, man. Yeah. <laughs> Got to talk. Talk it out. Communicate. Yeah, that's it. Um, and then, uh, you got a billboard, uh, in Cardiff, let's say, what do you want written on that billboard? Oh, oh, that's very, that's a good question. <laughs> oh, let me think. Let me think. Let me think. OCD. Uh, it would probably go. It would probably be something like. Um, OCD is. I think Andrew Huberman said this. By the way, do you know Andrew Huberman? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I don't know him personally, but yeah. No, of course. Yeah, well, yeah. I, well, I, I did try and get him on the podcast. Actually, did you? No, no like, okay, that would be sick. <laughs> Keep going. Yeah. yeah <laughs> <I'll try. laughs> um, I would say uh OCD is the number seven most debilitating conditions out of all. Mm-hmm. Please do not use it flippantly. Something like that. I'd probably try and diminish the stigma. That's what I'd try and do. Yeah, nice. I like that. He's, he he said it's number seven from the thing that I I I I was watching on his I don't know what on his YouTube channel. Yeah, he did a whole episode on OCD, didn't he? Well, when he said that, I was just like, "Well, that's a huge like statistic to put out there in the world and say it's number seven. Yeah. And then I thought, bloody hell! Like, I know how debilitating OCD is because I've got it, but like people need that's like if you tell people who don't know what OCD is and say, "Well, it's actually number seven most debilitating," not that. Not that it should be, you know, I'm not saying that you're competing with other like, debilitating conditions, but to know that it's number seven in the list, yeah. like that's that's huge, man. Like, especially because it's so stigmatized and so used off so often used, you know, flippantly. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, people need to know. Agreed, yeah. They need to know what it is. It's, it's flipping horrendous. Yeah, no, I agree with that. It's a strong, a strong statistic. Um, and yeah, ACD is kind of often seen as a joke, which and leads to misdiagnosis and a wrong diagnosis so uh lastly duke anything else you wish you could have said or shared today i'm sure there's loads of things um i was really really bad at telling my story then i'm so That's sorry good. <laughs> here there and everywhere <laughs> um maybe some more more compulsions like running up and down the stairs is a big thing because okay. there's there's numbers on stairs you know one two three four five it's going up yeah, so okay. so i need to run past the number six a certain number of times for example um and when that was really bad i I was hitting like running up down the stairs over 50 times easy uh, and that was very tiring <laughs> yeah. um getting into bed can be an issue for me uh you know getting into bed because i want to go to sleep and i know when, when i'm in bed i'm going to sleep so if I have an intrusive thought, I'm in and out and I'm in and out. Mm. It's so unfair on my fiance, and I try my best to do to not do that with her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um and then I would say there's been once where I've like stapled my finger, for example, which was uh, which was a compulsion. Uh I've I've pulled out hair, I've punched myself in the face. I have uh what else have I done? A big one for me at the moment still as well is putting on clothes. I struggle to just even get dressed. I'm a grown man and I can't get dressed. <laughs> no, it's because I've got OCD. Um, no, I struggle just sometimes just to get dressed and then I'm often late for things. So I'll yeah. put on boxes. I'll have to put them on a certain way and then I'll take them off and then I'll put them on again. And then I finally got my boxes on and then the same thing happens with socks. And I finally get my socks on and then I've got to put trousers on. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It yeah. becomes time consuming. Um, and OCD is clever, man. And OCD... OCD does these things because it's like, ah, you have to wear clothes. You're going out. <laughs> you have to wear clothes. Yeah. So it was like, oh, let me let me grab you there. Um, yeah. I've had a little bit of driving OCD. Um, I'm just trying to like paint the picture just in case it helps anybody. That's all. Uh, 
And in terms of real event OCD, it's, uh, you know, looking back at things when, uh, things when maybe I've not been happy with the way I've acted and things like that. Yeah. Uh, and then just completely over analyzing things or completely overthinking those those scenarios. Uh, that's been very challenging. Uh, a lot of it's been to do with drink as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, I guess I'm sure there's plenty of other things I've not said. But as long as as long as I've mentioned as much as I can think of, that hopefully might resonate to somebody. Then yeah, I'm happy. I do have one more yeah. poem. Yeah, you want to do it? Yeah, and it's um, I've just done this actually in London for OCD Action for their carol service. Uh, oh, cool. Monday, did it Monday? Nice. Um, so this poem is festive. It's a festive poem. It's called "Dear Chris." Dear Chris, I know I'm older. I know you don't exist, but in case you're real, here it is: my Christmas list. I know I don't deserve gifts or to live a life of pure bliss, but I'm hurting. This is more like a desperate wish. Please let me wake up feeling free on the 25th. No more compulsions. Let intrusive thoughts become a myth. Let me be in the present with my family where I can happily live. Let my presence present the real me. No worry to contest with. That would be the best gift. I hope you're real. I feel disconnected. And even if you are, I guess you'll be busy with your checklists. <laughs> I know all about that, so don't worry if you forget this. Best wishes, Duke. Dear Chris, I'm not sure if you remember me or ever read my letter, but it's that time of year again. My thoughts aren't much better. They are harsh, they are cold like the North Pole weather in its worst ever snowstorm. My body tremors from the terrors. My mind is decorated with outcomes of tragedy. When I outrun just one intrusive thought, out comes a travesty. A Grinch who leaves me within an inch of thinking capacity, who wraps my brain in holly leaves, thinking becomes catastrophe. You ride your sleigh with sleigh bells and slate and reindeers. My mind is slain, he raises howl, he rains fears. I pray and I pray, my tears form rain, and that rain clears the pain from the flames until it happens again the same year. Please, Chris, this 25th, Will you let my mind be calm? I want to decorate the tree without thinking of hanging or harm. I want to hang stockings, pull crackers without thinking of bombs. I guess I really am crackers. If I think you're even listening, please tell me I'm wrong. Sing me a song. Distract me. Give me wings to move on. Away from the pain. Away from the sins. Will you respond? Yours sincerely, Duke. Dear Chris, this might be the last letter I ever write to you. Fears have heightened. I cannot keep on fighting through this tightening noose. OCD has my life aloof. The frightening truth? I can't find the light. I'm screwed. How do I get out of this? How do I get you to answer my very first wish? The only gift I ever wanted was for you to lift this hydraulic press of responsibility off my shoulders before I'm squished. My brother just had a baby boy. I want to spend time with my family, watch him play with toys, rip the wrapping paper with radiating joy, without the struggle of uncertainty and the razor blade in noise. OCD tells me I do not deserve this. But Chris, know this, I am determined. This is my last letter to you. Maybe you never wrote back on purpose. I guess I needed to figure this out for myself to know I am worth it. I refuse to live on where I'm not really living. I refuse to stop doing the things that I love that I feel are fulfilling. I will be the hero of my story, defeating OCD, the villain. I will spread this message to empower others, as Christmas is forgiving. Many, many thanks, Duke. Thank you very much. That's awesome. That's awesome. You did that at OCD Action's carol service? Yeah, I did that on Monday. Yeah, that was really cool. It went down went down well a lot of people were really really yeah. really kind and uh, came up to me it was nice yeah yeah i oh. love it i love that stuff it reminds me of i don't know if this is a compliment or an insult but m&m stan oh that's that's far from an insult that's definitely okay, good but it's just because it's much more gruesome isn't it stan and but um, oh that's very gruesome yeah but it is um, a great song oh it's a fantastic song it's uh such such, such clever storytelling and yeah, I, I I would assume when I was writing that there was a bit of um, an influence from that 
from Stan there. But I do have my own version of Stan coming out soon, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah, I've got a, got a cover of Stan. So I hope my plan is to drop it before before the new year, but we'll see. I'll okay. Have to, I, well, see. so anyone listening to this, this should come out about new year. I'll put the links to your stuff in the show notes anyway. So I'm sure if you've released it by then, you people can check it out through those channels. Wicked. Um, but look, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your your poetry and uh, obviously your story. More importantly, like it was great to hear it again and and in more detail. Um, I know it will no, resonate thanks. with many. So thank you. No, thanks. Honestly, thanks for having me. And I just think what you're doing is awesome, man. And your consistency just to tell get get people to tell their stories and you know each story is gonna resonate with so many people uh you know new things new things come up but also i think allowing having a platform to allow people to share their stories who have ocd mm-hmm. is huge it's just it's just phenomenal this thank you're doing awesome work man appreciate it mate i appreciate it thank you for listening to this week's podcast And thank you to our Patreons who helped make this episode possible. And if you would like to find out more about Patreon and the rewards and benefits, then there will be a link in the episode description. If you enjoy the OCD Stories podcast and would like to support us with a one-time tip slash donation, please go to theocdstories.com forward slash support. All tips, no matter how large or small, are greatly appreciated. Please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to the podcast. And thank you to NoCD for supporting our work. If you want to find out more about NoCD, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. And until we speak, take care.